I think it's safe to say that there aren't many examples of games that have had a more turbulent development history than Final Fantasy XV. Being announced over ten years before it was eventually released, it definitely slots right into the middle of that awkward early to mid-2010s era of Square Enix where projects would get shown, then basically disappear for half a decade. I mean, you know it's gonna be rough when just the history of this game's development has an entire Wikipedia page dedicated to it. Eventually, though, the game that started off as just another entry in the incredibly cursed Fabula Nova Crystal's Final Fantasy XIII universe would transform into the game that was released near the end of 2016. A little personal history, I was reasonably hyped for Versus XIII for the first few years. I mean, hell, it was half the reason I bought a PS3. But, I mean, the other half was to play The Last Guardian, so, uh, yeah, let's just say my purchasing choices did not age well. By the time the game was confirmed to be, you know, a real thing that was actually going to come out, it had been such a long time, I wasn't really sure I was going to buy it day one. To this day, I have no idea why, and I've never seen this happen before or since, but for some reason, Amazon was selling pre-orders of FF15 and a few other upcoming games for like, a third off full retail price, which was enough to convince me to grab it. My day one playthrough lasted about 20 hours or so. I got to the main dungeon of Chapter 7 when the news about the planned post-launch content update started to come out. At that point, I was just like, okay, well, back on the shelf you go, see in another few years. And yeah, after the third content pack dropped in late 2017, I hit the reset button and finished my first full playthrough. Now for this playthrough, for this retrospective that I'm doing right now, I played through the Royal Edition on PC, which is the definitive final state of the game, and I have to give a quick disclaimer. I fully acknowledge that the game I played in 2022 is very different from the one that originally released in 2016. While 15 did review well on launch, it had a pretty controversial fan reception, and no small part of that was due to its clearly half-finished state at the time. I've played through this game in all three stages of its life, the beginning, the middle, and the end, so I can say from personal experience that while some things have stayed the same, there have been a lot of changes. So, while this video is a retrospective of Final Fantasy XV as a whole, when I critically examine its strengths and flaws, I'll specifically be talking about the version people are most likely to play today, the Royal Edition. And since I try to make my videos for both people who have and haven't played the game before, I'll let you know beforehand when I start talking about endgame spoilers. So, with all that out of the way, come with me on a journey as we take a look at the most recent mainline entry in the series, Final Fantasy XV. Final Fantasy XV's setting was in the public consciousness for so long leading up to its release, it's hard not to know what the premise is about at this point. The game starts on a cold open. A strange looking version of our protagonist is fighting a fiery figure with three companions. You take cover behind a wall, and then the scene ends pretty much as soon as it began. I wonder what that was about. What was with the characters looking different, wink wink foreshadowing? Anyways, on to our real premise. I feel like half of this is just me repeating Type Zero's premise again, but basically, Final Fantasy XV takes place on Eos, a world that's currently in the middle of a war. On one side, you have the technologically superior Nilfheim Empire, a military powerhouse dead set on taking over the world, and are doing a pretty damn good job of it. Eos is divided into two major continents, and the Empire has fully conquered theirs while practically controlling 90% of the other. The only place truly outside the Empire's stranglehold is our second faction, the Kingdom of Lucius and the Crown City Insomnia. This is thanks to the efforts of the current leader of Lucius, King Regis, who safeguards a crystal in the heart of Insomnia and maintains a magical barrier that keeps the Empire out. The only issue is, maintaining this barrier is having a pretty harsh effect on his body. My man here is not looking good for age 50. Turns out crystal age is your worse than a pack a day before breakfast. It's pretty clear this situation isn't going to hold out for much longer, so the plan for peace is twofold. First, King Regis plans to hold a peace signing agreement, where the Empire gains full control of all Lucian territory outside the city of Insomnia in exchange for having the minimum amount of chill on the whole world domination thing. Yeah, just invite the Empire and all their strongest generals to sign a piece of paper ten feet away from where you keep the magic crystal. No way that's going to go wrong. Number two is the arranged marriage of his son, our protagonist Noctis, and the heir apparent of the Empire's vassal state Tenebrae, Lunafreya Nox Flore. And that's where we come in. The game starts with Noctis saying goodbye to his father, and departing on the journey to go meet his betrothed along with his three closest homies. We have the shield of the royal family and resident big man Gladiolus, the brains of the group and Noctis' retainer, Ignis, and, uh, just really close friend and resident commoner, Prompto. You might have noticed that this is one of the smallest parties in the Final Fantasy series, and it's made up of just four dudes. I mean, Noctis spends so much time hanging around with only the fellas, he gets experience points just by talking to girls. Noctis, 
ノクトにはルナフレーナ様がいるしね This means the game relies heavily on the development and interplay between just these four characters, a point we'll talk about more as we get deeper into the video. We first get control of our protagonists when their car breaks down at the side of the road and they have to push it, which is the game subtly taking time to quick establish these four's relationship and their group dynamic. To see why something like this is so important now more than ever, let's take a speedrun look back at the party makeup of every previous mainline Final Fantasy title. Not counting the first three, the only entries where the majority of the party know each other before the start of the game are ten, with the exception of the main character Titus, and eight. Sorta. The standard pattern for Final Fantasy games is the characters meeting and getting to know each other as the game progresses, and we, as the player, getting to be there for that full development. In 15, however, these characters already have a long standing relationship, so it's in these opening scenes the game tries to show, not tell us their dynamic, and how they interact. This is especially apparent in the opening scene with Noctis and his father. While the main four have a whole game to show the player their relationship and then further develop on it, FF15 basically crams in as much as it can about Noctis and the King in this one scene. It's the only non flashback shot we'll get of these two together in the same room in the entire game. Which, I'm gonna be honest, isn't enough for how quickly the plot progresses from here. Of course, if you want to see more of their relationship, you can always go through, uh, <clears throat> other means. And don't think writing this video without talking about that at some point. As the group are pushing the car, the main theme plays an honestly really good rendition of Stand By Me by Florence and the Machine, and we get our title crawl. Now, I don't mean to nitpick however many minutes early into this video, but、uh, this scene kind of ends too soon. Like, I mean, at least wait to the end of the first chorus before you fade to black, you know? Anyways, the gang pushes the car to a local garage, Hammerhead, where they realize their capital city money isn't any good out here in the Badlands. You'd think the king or someone would have planned for that before they sent Noctis off, but whatever. So, to build up some clout and cash for the car, you do a few local side quests for this game's version of Sid and his granddaughter, Sydney. I mean, Cindy. I'm not letting it go, we're talking about this later. This is sort of your tutorial area. You do a few missions, get a feel for how the game works, and basically get a mini version of what you can expect from the overall gameplay structure. After you get the car back, the gang heads to a port where they find out their ferry has been cancelled, so they spend a night at a hotel room. This is where the main event that kicks off the plot of the game goes down. You see, I made a joke about it, but King Regis ain't stupid. He knew that the peace signing treaty wasn't gonna end well, so half the reason for him sending Noctis off was so that he wasn't in the city when the residents of each country's local retirement home started throwing bullets at each other. We get an oddly suspicious looking cutscene of Insomnia being destroyed by the Empire and King Regis being killed, and some of you might already know why this scene feels so out of place. It's because not only was it originally not in the game, it's not even from the game. It's from the Final Fantasy XV spin off movie, Kingsglaive, which dropped a few months before the game released. It was honestly a good call to stick it in the game, because otherwise Noctis just wakes up to his homies telling him the city's gone, but the way it's integrated is kinda.、Uh... It's just out of context silent footage of random scenes with an audio track playing in the background. I'm sure they could have mixed together an actual competent cutscene with the movie footage, but I'm willing to bet that there was a mess of licensing and other issues preventing them from doing that, especially with the celebrity voices. You see, instead of just using the voice actors from the game, Kingslave had Cersei Lannister as Luna Freya, Jesse Pinkman as Nyx Ulrich, and Sean Bean as King Regis. An odd choice, but what's even odder is that the characters in Kingslave are modeled after other real world people, instead of, you know, the actual characters from the game. I mean, Luna Freya here especially barely looks like she does in the game. I, I don't get why they did this. Anyways, slightly baffling decisions aside, Noctis and the gang return to Insomnia and confirm that it has, in fact, been destroyed. Everyone they know and care about is probably gone, and they have no choice but to accept that and push on with their journey as rain falls from the sky. To drop my one big brain take for the video, this is a good, if not a little heavy handed, example of pathetic fallacy. Which sounds like I'm throwing an insult, but it's the literary term for whenever the weather matches the emotion of the characters. Now, while you have spent a fair amount of time with the characters by this point, as a player, you don't really have much personal emotional investment in Insomnia when it falls. Unless you watched Kingslave, which I have, and, w h o o haha, I do not recommend doing, your entire experience with the city of Insomnia and the people who live there has been contained in that one cutscene from the beginning. I'll get into this and other similar issues related to it later in the video, but for now, just know that I think that this is a bit of a missed opportunity to make something that matters to the characters matter to the player in the same way. Now that we got the setup out of the way, let's talk about Final Fantasy XV's gameplay. 
From 1 through 10, the gameplay systems in the mainline Final Fantasy games have been pretty similar. There have been some pretty major change-ups, like the switch from basic turn-based to ATB to CTB, but for the most part, you could go in pretty much knowing what to expect. 15, however, like 12 and 13 before it, goes in the complete opposite direction, and this time around, you have full control of your characters in real-time battles. On the surface, this game plays pretty much like a standard action RPG, but it has a few nuances. As the third game in my unofficial Tabata trilogy, you can also see a bit of DNA lifted from his previous game, Final Fantasy Type-0. Not only that, but you can even see some Kingdom Hearts influence as well, likely some stuff Nomada brought to the table when he was directing. It's kinda cool to see these influences interact with each other, but enough of that for now, so what are we working with here? Starting from the basics, you have an attack button, and you can press it down for each individual attack, or you hold it and Noctis will continue attacking your target. You can also tilt the stick in each of the four directions to change the type of attack you do. Let me give you a quick example. For your standard sword, the up attack is a stab with a lot of forward momentum. The left and right side attacks make you do a sidestep slash in that direction, and the down attack makes Noctis do a backflip slash with iframes, kinda like Raiden's offensive defense from Metal Gear Rising. Yes, I have that game on my mind, why do you ask? The properties of these four directional attacks are different for each weapon, and while I'm not gonna waste our time and name them all, they can vary up quite a bit. For example, the Greatsword's back attack is a charge slash you can use on downed enemies to delete them from the FF15 verse. While your moveset isn't as deep as a dedicated action games is, you've got a pretty big variety of attacks, as well as a bunch of different weapon types to play around with here. Which is why I don't really agree with the, look, you just hold the button down and the battle plays itself, battle system bad, take. Yeah, if you deliberately choose the most unfun and least effective way to play that's gonna lead you getting killed in the majority of fights anyways, you can scrape by, but you obviously aren't gonna have a good time. I do have to make one big concession, however. As far as I know, the game never explicitly explains the directional attack system to you. The most I could find is this one line from the skippable tutorial I had to go back and hunt for, because I almost couldn't believe this mechanic wasn't mentioned anywhere. You can tell from the wording here by looking at it yourself, but it doesn't really explicitly say how the directional attacks work. While I'm sure many players like myself stumbled on it by accident and worked it out from there, this means learning the majority of your basic attack's depth is reasonably missable, which I think is honestly a mistake and should have been something they fixed in the Royal Edition. Or a patch, or something. The reason directional attacks are so important is because positioning plays a big factor in 15's combat. Back attacks have been an integral part in the Final Fantasy series for decades, and while they don't really fit in the combat style of an action RPG, they make a sort of comeback with the blindside links. On the whole, attacks that land on an enemy's back will do 1.5 times their normal damage, and if a teammate is nearby, they'll join Noctis to do a powerful Link Strike attack. Each of these Link Strike attacks ends in a cool animation that really shows off the personality of these characters through the combat, usually ending in fist bumps or something. Final Fantasy XV really encourages you to look for openings to pull these attacks off and cash in on some big damage. Noctis has one other ability called the Point Warp, a stylish action where he throws his sword and teleports to its location. Not only is it a really cool flare move and a smart visual design choice, it's good for keeping yourself in combat, giving you an offensive tool to keep up pressure. You can also use it as a tool to get out of combat and Point Warp to a safe spot where Noctis will recover HP and MP. Overall, it's just a really versatile tool that really rounds out Noctis' kit, as well as being this game's sort of flagship feature integrated in the lore, being explained as something only people who have power bestowed upon them by the Lucius bloodline can use. As for defending, you have two options here. If you hold down the defend button, Noctis will automatically phase through attacks at the cost of MP, and if you double tap the button, he'll do a dodge roll with iframes. There's a bit of skill factor involved in this, as you can unlock an ability extremely early on where if you press square just before an attack lands, you can dodge it without using any MP. The screen will also do a quick slowdown, which for me, man, say no goddamn more. Along with that is a parry mechanic, which has to have one of the most misleading prompts of all time. Your initial instinct is to press the button at the right time, since, you know, pretty universally that's how parries work, but you actually just need to hold it when the prompt comes up till you're given an opportunity to counterattack. No shade thrown here if you took a while to get it. It all happens pretty fast, and I'm pretty sure it's universally accepted that this game doesn't do a great job visually clarifying what this prompt means, so it's gonna take a try or two to figure it out. Now, speaking of poor communication from the game, there are two types of enemy attacks that interact with our two main defensive options. There are attacks that can be phased through, and attacks that need to be dodged with the roll or point warp or whatever. One of my main complaints about the combat system is that there's no real way to visually determine at a glance which is which. You have to memorize each specific enemy's tells and windups to know how you should deal with each attack. 
The issue is, is that Final Fantasy XV's enemy lineup is so large, and you spend relatively not much time fighting a single specific monster, that it's not really feasible to put that amount of dedication into every single one. What this results in is you eating a lot of hits that don't really feel like they were deserved. While this might be a minor complaint to some, what really gets me is how easy it would have been to fix something like this. Enemies already glow white when they're about to use an attack that can be parried, why not glow yellow or something when they're about to use an unblockable attack? It's a small thing, but it would have gone a long way to tightening up the combat. And while we're on the subject of gripes, oh man, does this game despise you for having the audacity to commit the crime of... ...fight in a slightly enclosed area. The camera just can't handle physical objects being in the way of the action. There's this early game quest where these dogs ambush you in a small shack and it just turns into a visual soup. Excuse me, Final Fantasy XV? Uh, yes, I'd like to see the battle. Can you please move your giant goddamn shrubs? I can't see where I'm getting body from. And you know what? One last gripe while we're at it. Can we please leave the four stealth tailing sections in last gen? Who's like, oh boy, yay, slowly following behind a guy walking like he's got nowhere to be? I had to do a double take when this shit came up. Like, 2016 was way too late to still not realize these are pacing poison. I think there's a reason for that though, and we'll get into it later. Anyways, you might have noticed something with the combat system so far. You hold a button down to attack, and you hold a button down to defend. This means you essentially have two states, offensive and defensive, and you switch between them based on what the situation demands. It almost kind of feels like they were trying to integrate some sort of turn-based action in a game with real-time combat. This usually works pretty well. When you're up against a group of monsters, switching between targets, keeping an eye out for someone's back to tackle, the combat feels fast and satisfying. It also works really well when fighting large boss monsters with multiple places to hit them. Where it kinda doesn't work as well is in one-on-one -on -one fights with enemies on the stronger side, because your attacks usually don't interrupt theirs, which means you'll just be sitting there holding block as they pull off their combo strings just to get one or two slashes in. You can't really be as fluid, which is the main point of the combat. You just gotta sit there like, Mom said it's my turn to play. When Final Fantasy XV's combat works, it works well, but in the times it doesn't, it's kind of a bit of a slog. But, the combat is deepened up when you factor in that you've got a full party to work with. You have these team-up attacks that can dish out big damage or get you out of a tough spot, as well as this game's version of the Limit Break, the Armager. For this one, Noctis slashes at a bunch of different enemies at high speeds like in that Versus 13 trailer, but I didn't really get much use out of it, since going Gorilla Mode offense is a good way to get hammer-fisted into the dirt. You can end it early for a big attack though, which is much more my speed. The last combat wildcard I want to talk about is the summons, and uh, oh boy, this is kind of a weird handling of them. As part of Noctis' journey, he has to get the blessing of this game's summons, the Astrals, and he can use them in combat. Sometimes. Maybe? If you've been a really good boy, sometimes you'll get a prompt at the bottom of your screen to summon one of these gods to help you in battle. The animation and sound design of these are some of the most amazing shit I've seen, but like I said, it's 99% random. Which means, half the time Rama will show up, it's only to smite a particularly belligerent giraffe. Of course, all this stuff about the battle system is assuming you're playing as Noctis. While he is the main character and the only one you can control outside of combat, one cool feature added in the Royal Edition is being able to switch to your other teammates. After you've unlocked the ability, you can hold down two buttons at any time in combat to switch to another member of the Entourage. You might be thinking, yeah, Final Fantasy game, playing as other members of the party, sounds pretty normal to me, and you're not wrong. Thing is, I really gotta emphasize how differently every character plays in comparison to Noctis. You're slashing and flying around one minute, then the next you're playing Metal Gear Prompto. It literally turns the game into a third-person shooter. Obviously, Noctis has the most combat options available to him. He's the only one who can equip different weapons, use the team-up attacks, and cast magic. But, each of the other characters were slowly developed over the course of a year, and as a result, have a really tight, polished feeling to them. And if I'm feeling particularly bold that day, I might even say in some battles, they feel even better to play than Noctis himself. They definitely have a lot less options than the main man, so if you had to play as, say, Ignis for the full game, the combat might get stale a lot quicker. But, with that more limited moveset comes with it a bigger focus on a few very solid core mechanics, which all work really well. 
I initially dismissed this changing characters thing as a who cares gimmick included with the Royal Edition, but now, I actually think switching up which character you play as every now and again is the way to go. Consumables have always been a staple of the Final Fantasy series, and in 15, they come in two forms. The first is magic, and yeah, I know what you're thinking. What? Magic is a consumable? Yeah, it's weird. I don't know what kind of gas was leaking in the Square Enix offices when they dreamed this one up. So the way it works is you draw magic power from these spots on the ground, then use that power to create limited use spells that you can cast in battle. As insane as it seems, I really do get what they were going for here. Magic in the original Final Fantasy was based on the Vancian magic system from D&D, and this is sort of attempting to be a callback to that while also having its own unique take thrown in. While these draw points are plentiful enough where you can pretty much cast magic whenever you feel like it, it's just a chore to consistently stay on top of it. You have to open up your elementcy menu, scroll to the element, slowly hold R1 to increase the amount, slowly scroll through the items to choose the one to use to enhance the spell, then equip it. All to use fire alike, twice. It's a pure pace assassinator, and not useful enough where I felt like I wanted to regularly engage with the system. I always kept a few spells on hand, but I didn't save them because they're valuable, I did it because I couldn't be asked making more. Also, spells have friendly fire, so half the time you just end up team killing your party. Something they knew was an issue because in the Royal Edition you start the game with an item in your inventory which negates the friendly fire. Just turn it off! You can do that! My brother in Christ, you made the game! Maybe you could argue that they wanted to leave the choice up to the player, but I'd argue the standard should have been the other way around. I get that integrating magic to an action-based battle system wasn't as simple as it might seem, but I don't think I would have gone with this whole craftable bomb type setup. Final Fantasy XV's other consumable is items, and it's these items that turn XV's combat system into a Pandora's box. You might not think they'd be that controversial, press button use potion, but it's the game's attempt to treat items like previous Final Fantasy games while also having a battle system that's very much not like previous Final Fantasy games where the issue comes in. There is no opportunity cost to using a potion in 15, which means if you stock up on healing items beforehand, you'll likely never see a game over screen throughout your entire playthrough. The only penalty is, you'll have to sit there and watch as the battle comes to a halt and the animation for using a consumable plays out. And considering in the late game you can only take about one or two hits before needing to heal, you're going to see these animations a lot. You can tell that the developers knew they fumbled this one, since in Final Fantasy VII Remake, despite also being a game with real-time combat, consumables require a bar of ATB to use, instead of 15's all-you-can-drink system. Now this has really got me torn in two directions, more than you might think. Of course I believe that if a player has the ability to absolutely trivialize a game's challenge through something as simple as item use, that's a flaw in the game's design and should be treated as such. But the question is, how much does that affect the game as a whole? Nier Automata is one of my favorite games, and it's much more skewed towards the action side of the action RPG spectrum. That said, I can completely snap that game's difficulty in half about an hour in and make it literally impossible to ever die, and it's not even hard to do. So if that's still one of my favorite games, how hard should I go in on 15 for this? All said, it's a difficult call to make, and while I think these things are better judged on a case-by-case -case basis, I'm gonna say it's a lame part of 15's battle system, but it doesn't tank it. The thing about Final Fantasy 15's combat is that I think it's a bit misunderstood. In a gaming landscape where the easiest way to describe something is to compare it to something else, and believe you me, I have seen some astronomically weird takes of people comparing one thing to another thing, 15's gameplay is kind of hard to compare directly to any one other thing. It's close enough to a full action game where it could be mistaken and played as one, but it has its own idiosyncrasies that make it feel more like an RPG RPG. It's like this weird middle ground, and I think going in with the expectation that it's either a full action game or an RPG in line with previous games in the series is going to disappoint you on both ends. So, taking Final Fantasy XV's battle system for what it is, the big question is, overall, is it any good? First off, I want to say right off the bat that it's a completely serviceable battle system. It 100% works from start to finish. It has its flaws, and I've, you know, mentioned more than enough of those on the way to this paragraph, but flaws are concrete things I can point to. What's harder to describe is the overall feel of a battle system, but throughout my multiple playthroughs of 15, I've always thought the same thing. There are some fights in genre of enemies where the battle system doesn't work so well, and you really feel it. Sometimes, the battle system just has this uncomfortable looseness to it. But, for the majority of the game, it's fun. It's fast-paced and engaging. I like it, and it never gave me that nail-in-the-coffin feeling some games do where you feel that urge to avoid fights in the late game because you just can't be asked with the battle system.
But RPGs aren't all about battles, and especially in the Final Fantasy series, the world the game takes place in is pretty damn important as well. You can argue the semantics of whether or not older Final Fantasy games' world maps are quote, open world or not. But I think we can all agree, 15 is the first game in the series to do this more modern take on open world games. Now I don't know about you all, but to me, this is a pretty obvious case of something I'm gonna term reactionary game design. Final Fantasy XIII was linear, incredibly so, and it got a lot of heat for that. Like, like a lot of heat. So while I'm sure there were probably other factors that influenced the decision, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the reaction to XIII's level design made some higher-ups on XV's development staff roll their sleeves up and go like, Oh, they want open? I'll show them open. Now regardless of why they decided to go with an open world, I think what's more important is to look at how it integrates itself into the story and gameplay. First and foremost, FF15 is a road trip adventure, and the open world setting complements that vibe. It's just you and the three lads on the open road, driving your car, going questing, and hunting monsters. In fact, the car plays a big role in the adventure overall. It's a bit weird to get used to at first, but you can think of your car as sort of your anchor. The only place you can fast travel to on foot is your car, so where you park it is an important part of planning the route to your destination. It really makes you think about where you're going, what you'll do there, and where you'll go from there. You can fast travel with the car to parking spots or major destinations you've previously visited, but for the first time, you'll have to get there yourself. So you can really visualize the progress you're making as you travel to new places. You come to rely on the car, and there are a few select times in the game where you don't have access to it, and it really changes up your options. But they were kinda weird about the car leading up to release. If you kept up with the demos, you might remember the episode Duske one and how the car wasn't in it. And when they made that demo, they were afraid that if the car was in it, people would think the newest Final Fantasy game was, quote, a car game. Yeah, uh, I don't know what kind of test consumer Square Enix has where if they see a glimpse of a license plate, they'll think FF15 is a stealth Gran Turismo game, but whatever. Traveling in the car can be pretty cool at times. You get to watch the four friends' different animations play out, listen to a conversation or two, and see the landscapes pass by. You're making your way to your destination while your car's tape deck plays Spear Unplugged or some other FF track, and it's just a really good vibe. But that isn't the only part of the game that makes it feel like a road trip. Each of your companions has a special skill that's used during your travels. Noctis can go fishing, which at the end of the day is just a cool distraction, but it does have surprisingly in-depth mechanics. Gladiolus can forage and get extra items while you're out on foot. But that's just scratching the surface. Prompto takes pictures of your journey while you go about your day. It doesn't seem like it at first, but this is a really cool mechanic. Like, really cool. At the end of the day when you set up camp, you can look through these pictures, and it's kind of like a mini summary of what you did throughout the day. You can then save the pictures you want in an album that's sort of like a journal of everything you've been through. I think in general, for a bigger RPG like this, events from the early hours might get forgotten by the player as they progress through the game. This is a pretty clever way to have a collection of subtle prompts to remind the player of everything that they've been through. And, since the pictures are randomly generated based on everything you did throughout the day, it gives them a personal touch that I think would be hard to replicate with any other mechanic. This picture thing makes a really big comeback later, so keep it in the back of your mind while we move on. Now Ignis' cooking mechanic, oh boy, now this is some real shit. In a good way. If you camp at the end of the day, Ignis will cook a meal for the party based on the ingredients you have on hand and the recipes he knows. You get temporary stat bonuses based on what kind of food you cook, but forget about the practical for a second. Like, just take a look at this food. Look how immaculately rendered it is. Get out of the way, Cyberpunk 2077 pizza. This is where it's at right here. Now, I like cooking, so this might just be a me thing, but I was always on the lookout for new ingredients and recipes to widen the amount of things I can make. Not just going like, guys, I will sell every single one of our worldly possessions and bankrupt this party for six tomatoes and a steak. This cooking thing is a small touch, but I never get tired of it. So I was workshopping whether or not to talk about this before the photos and cooking or afterwards, but I figured it's best to have that context first, so we're doing it this way. You might have noticed I kept mentioning the word camp in that last section, and that's because FF15 works on a day-night cycle. It's kind of cool how over the course of a day, you can see the sun rise, then watch as the shadows drop over the land as it sets. Uh, we're just watching the sun move across the sky. When it gets to here, we can drink again! This day-night cycle is really integral to the whole Final Fantasy XV experience, and I can think of the perfect example as to why. One plot point in the game is that the days are slowly getting shorter and shorter. 
You're explicitly told this in the late game, but before that, I was having my suspicions. I mean, I know that the sun sets at like 4pm in Japan, but I was getting the feeling something was up. I had this feeling I was accomplishing less and less during the course of a day. And because of how integral the beginning, middle, and end of your days are in 15, you can really notice even extremely subtle changes like this, and I thought it was a nice touch. Anyways, the reason daylight is so important is because in the world of Eos, nighttime is basically a daily apocalypse. Giant monsters called demons spawn out of the ground and roam the lands, which is why pretty much every town in the game is decorated with massive lights to keep them away. Figuring out a place to sleep is part of planning your day in 15, and this mainly takes the form of camping at rest spots. When the sun starts to go down, you and the boys pitch up a tent, which is where you do all that stuff I mentioned beforehand. Now this is a really smart idea. It implements quiet time, it brings everyone together, and it gives you a chance to slow down and see these characters relax for a moment. There's a lot of cool optional scenes when you camp that give you a chance to get to know your party members better. And this rolls into what I was saying earlier about giving time for our party members to show what kind of relationship they have with each other, since they're already friends at the start. The only problem is, the game undermines one of its best mechanics with its EXP system. Just like... um... Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion? In Final Fantasy XV, you tally up EXP and level up whenever you rest. This is fine, since camping is meant to bookend your day, but the problem is, other lodgings give you an EXP bonus modifier based on how fancy they are. While camping is the only time you can have Ignis cook for you and get temporary stat boosts, this means that it's usually more optimal to stay anywhere else other than a campsite. Sure, certain lodgings have bonus optional cutscenes when you stay there as well, but it really discourages you from camping, which has the most character interaction by far. Again, just like with the dodging thing, the most frustrating thing about this is how easy it would be to solve. I thought of it in like 10 seconds. Upgradable camp gear. Boom. Done. Add it to the things I wish were fixed in the Royal Edition list. Just a quick mechanic cleanup, aside from the danger, another reason you can't just wait out the night is the maximum health mechanic. In Final Fantasy XV, you have two health bars, your total health and your maximum health. Eagle-eyed viewers might remember this mechanic from Final Fantasy XIII too, but I think the implementation is way better here. In Final Fantasy games, your average random encounter usually isn't going to kill you, unless you fall asleep at the wheel or something. Instead, it's your resources slowly being grinded down over the course of a dungeon slash large segment of the world map that usually does you in. Meaning, you have to manage your MP and items carefully till you can reach your next rest point. Knowing that the previous system the Final Fantasy games used for long-term health wasn't going to jive well with the ARPG open world setting, 15 flips the script a little bit, while still retaining those core concepts. I mean, in an action RPG, every battle should have some potential to kill you, otherwise there'd be no challenge and the game would be boring. Through battle, you lose maximum HP over time, so the amount you can recover is slowly being whittled down throughout the day. While you can recover your remaining HP with items, your maximum HP can only be recovered by A, camping slash sleeping at an inn, or B, using far more expensive consumables. This gives you another gameplay reason to rest, folding the mechanic back into the overall experience. It's stuff like this why I think it works so well. There are so many mechanics that reinforce the day-night road trip cycle. Furthermore, you have AP, which is like a secondary kind of progression besides EXP and leveling up. You earn AP based on your actions in the gameplay and can spend it on upgrades for your characters. I think Final Fantasy games with a double power-up system like this have the most satisfying kind of character progression. I mean, give it a think for a quick sec. Earning job points in Final Fantasy V, leveling up your summons in VI, powering up materia in seven, getting ability points from equipment in nine. It gives you something to look forward to other than the ding 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 level up and offers more consistent rewards for character progression. Now we're spilling a bit into the visuals territory here, but Eos is a straight up beautiful open world. There's so many different environments and vistas, it really feels like no matter where you go, there's something beautiful to see. There's also a lot of stuff to do, especially in the Royal Edition. The map is littered with icons for side activities. There's even this arcade game you can play if you feel like a quick diversion. Eh, it's kind of cool, I guess. Obviously, the nature of these means that some are going to be decent and others are going to be pointless wastes of time, but there are a lot of options if you feel like diving in. You can travel across the world via road with your car, or you can use the surprisingly in-depth chocobos to go off-road into the bush. Did I mention this game has chocobo drifting? Also, uh, I'm the protagonist, that means I get the special color chocobo. 
To fill out the icons on the map, like procurement spots and campsites, you head to these roadside diners and chat up the local tipster. It's kind of like a less irritating, more thematically appropriate version of the Ubisoft towers. Hunts from Final Fantasy XII also make a return, and you can pick those up here as well. Overall, the open world was made to complement the game's structure, which is the most important thing. Open world versus linear structures aren't inherently better than one another. A game should be created with its structure in mind, and focus on building mechanics that complement that structure. Final Fantasy XV knows what kind of game it wants to be. It's an open world game, and that thought was kept in mind when its developers made its mechanics, from side activities, to camping, to driving. Also, side note, I realized FF15 is one of the only games I've ever played that uses miles instead of kilometers. I'm gonna need someone to explain the Imperial system to me. This is where I have to take a turn and start talking about some negatives. 15's open world has some pretty big downsides. The first is that it's big and not that densely populated. It's good for going from destination to destination, but if you were to be dropped in a random part of the map without your car or a chocobo, you'd just have to sprint for minutes at a time desperately trying to crawl back to civilization. I have so much footage of me getting out of the car, slowly making my way to my destination, just to do one thing, then fast travel right back to the car. It's not really an open world that rewards you for going off the beaten path. Its scale is so large that you'd have a hard time finding anything of worth. Even when you're in the car, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I mentioned the car ride being a cool vibe before, but in some worst case scenarios, like to get to an out of the way side quest, you just have to put your hands in your lap and stare at the screen for five minutes. There's no danger on the road and Ignis will drive the car for you. You just sit there and watch your destination bar slowly tick down. Which leads me to the side quests, and uh, oh boy, oh man. Before I even get into them, I gotta say they exacerbate the previous issue because they're all early 2010s open world style side quests that are structured like go here, do thing, come back. You'll often find yourself checking off multiple ones in a close together area just to save yourself a few trips, but then if the places you turn in those side quests are different, it defeats the purpose anyways. You can fast travel, yeah, but these load times are long, even on my PC's SSD. And believe you me, I remember how long this game takes to load on a PS4. Legitimately, you usually gotta weigh out what takes longer, sitting through the PS4's load screen, or just driving the car there. It just kills the momentum. All of this would be a minor annoyance if the side quests were well designed. If you were getting legitimately good story beats and character moments from these side quests, you wouldn't care, because they'd all feel substantial enough where you wouldn't treat them like ticking off checkboxes. Do I need to say it? You know what's coming next. They're ticking off checkboxes. I have multiple side quests about going to get beans or some shit. There's just, there's nothing here. Barely any have some kind of substantial story, or literally anything. None of these people feel any shame for asking the literal king of their country to go press X on a truck in the woods. Till you hit the total of like, five side quests in the game that were given an ounce of budget. I'll give you some examples. This quest where you have to fight a behemoth named Deadeye actually feels like it had a lot of polish put into it. It's atmospheric, it has actual cutscenes, and it ends in a boss fight. Then, you realize it's got polish because it was made to be a showcase for the game in the episode Duske demo. There's this one quest where you actually get to choose how to complete it based on what kind of food you like. It has multiple ways to do it, and each path has you fighting a different monster. This kind of open take on quest design isn't something you see often in the game, and it's the Cup Noodle collaboration quest. Look, I know the Cup Noodle thing is weird and gets a lot of heat for feeling out of place, but honestly, I think it's kind of funny. It has this weird charm. Besides, it's just some product placement in a video game. I'm not susceptible to marketing or anything. God damn it. Then you have the Final Fantasy XIV collab quest, which is actually really cool. There are fun character moments, and just from this cutscene with the party standing around talking to the Mako character, I can see how much actual effort was put into the dialogue and animations. It's like a full step up from anything else in the game. Then you start the quest, and the UI and sound effects change to the 14 ones. It references the MSQ of 14, and it just feels like actual care was put in. You fight a unique boss that leads to you getting an actual full new summon that probably won't show up in battle anyways, but it's more than any other side quests get you. You even get a set of Final Fantasy XIV costumes for the squad you can wear to the next convention. 
I'm sitting here looking at what the side quests could be like, what they look like at their best. Then I check the next one on the list and it's another catch five frogs quest. But honestly, it doesn't even matter. Other than the post-game ones, side quests in 15 become obsolete pretty quickly anyways. There's plenty in the early game, but then they dry out pretty quickly after level 20, so whatever. To sum it up, Final Fantasy XV has a 2012 open world cosplay in the close of a 2016 game. While there's a lot of stuff to do, the world itself is massive and sparse. And I get it. I get this is a symptom of its development. I get that some parts of this game had to be rushed, and we'll get into that further later on. It's just frustrating when I see how good this open world could be. I'm seeing these lovingly crafted side quests, these beautiful environments, and when it all works, I'm sitting there taking it all in, and it's great. And it's in these moments where Final Fantasy XV completely succeeds in what it was going for. It's just the times when I have to sit through an uneventful car ride to go get some beans to turn in for some experience and gill I don't really need when I realize there isn't a reason to do this. I could just get on with the main quest and have a much better time. Moving away from the negatives for a sec, I touched on it a bit before, but this game looks really good. As the only mainline Final Fantasy game specifically for the PS4, Xbox One generation of consoles, you can tell they put their all into making it look as nice as possible. I mean, pushing graphics has been on brand for Final Fantasy since, like, 1997, basically. This is especially true when you compare it to Lightning Returns, a game that came out only three years before, but one that had been crutching off visual assets made in 2009. Or maybe more appropriately, when you compare it to earlier builds of Versus 13 running on the PS3. FF15 has pretty much brought us to the singularity, where the lines between FMV and in-game cutscenes are starting to blur. You can definitely still tell, don't get me wrong, but it's not an immediate 100% shift like in every previous game, it takes a few seconds to click. This game looks fantastic, especially considering it came out six years ago. This game came out six years ago. Oh, time's passed too fast, so someone make it stop. And I'm gonna be totally honest, you're not getting the best footage out of me for this one. Final Fantasy XV is the first modern Final Fantasy that had a specific dedicated PC port made. 13? When that game's PC port dropped, it was locked to 30 FPS. That ain't even comparable. I can run this game pretty well, 1080-60 while also recording, but I'm sure on a NVIDIA 30 series graphics card or something running this game at 4K 120fps, it looked like it was a full console generation up. This game even has them crazy people PC settings. This definitely wasn't in the PS4 version. They really put effort into this port. As for technical issues, the lighting is weird in some places, and I don't remember it being like this on PS4. It's few and far between, but this scene with Iris's magic color changing hair, it really stood out. But Final Fantasy XV's visuals don't just lie in its raw graphical fidelity. Probably one, uh, upside to this game having one of the most notorious development cycles of all time is that you can tell some people were done their job way before others, and they had nothing to do but sit around polishing stuff. I mean, there's this mechanic where if you retap the sprint button right before your stamina runs out, it immediately refills again and you dash forward. Whoever thought of that had a lot of time on their hands. To get into some real, three people are gonna notice this, are you guys okay type of shit, take a look at this. I was driving down the highway in the rain when I noticed rainfall realistically piles up on your windshield and your wipers wipe it away. Like, whoa. Kind of mesmerizing to be honest. You also sometimes temporarily get guest characters in this game who you can camp out with. I cooked up mushroom skewers for the party and was watching their eating scene when I was like, hold up, wait a minute, she's eating the skewers too. Do you see what I'm getting at here? They legit made food-specific animations for guest characters that most players might never see. There's other examples like this throughout the game, and while I won't list every single one, I'm sure that there's also plenty of stuff I didn't see during my playthrough if they're going this specific. This game's character design is pretty good as well. For the main party, it's a bit low-hanging fruit since there's like literally four of them, but each of their designs does a good job at conveying their personality. In general, the main characters of this game are all designed well, but the NPCs are kinda cookie cutter, so it's hit and miss. The monster designs are pretty novel as well. Final Fantasy XIII kinda went its own way with its enemies. There were a few creatures from the usual Final Fantasy bestiary, but for the most part, they were made specifically for that game. By the way, I'm using XIII as a comparison point so much because it's the last non-MMO single-player mainline entry in the series before XV, just letting you know. You might have picked up on it by now, but 15 is a game of sames and differences. 
Its opening tagline is, A Final Fantasy for Fans and First Timers. And while it does introduce a lot that's brand new, there's a lot of subtle callbacks to the rest of the series, especially FF1, which you might not expect. One of those callbacks is found in 15's monster lineup. There's obviously a ton of new ones, but a lot of familiar faces show up here. The main thing is, those faces are, uh, not so familiar. It's cool to see 15's take on monsters that were first introduced to the series 30 plus years ago, like how Sahagin went from Fishman to actual crocodile. The visual design of the summons is something that stuck out to me as well. In 15, their role in the story is something that's supposed to parallel the Greek gods, and they looked apart. The they're all more human looking than before, uh, except for Leviathan, and they're more benevolent protectors than monsters. I mean, in this game, Shiva and Ifrit got a legit romance going on. And forget about designs for a quick second, our main characters have a ton of costumes. Hang on a sec, it's not a 2010's Final Fantasy game unless it has an Assassin's Creed costume, for some reason I'll never understand, so let's see if 15 checks out. Aw oh yeah, there it is. I still don't get it. At least there's no Mass Effect costume this time. You've got an absolute ton of costumes to play dress up with, especially for Noctis. Also, it's a small, totally irrelevant thing that has no impact on the gameplay, but characters will complain it's hot if you wear a thick outfit, say, you know, the default all-black costumes to a hot area. You could dress up these characters all day, but you might have noticed, I've been staying eerily quiet about a suspicious box at the top of the main menu. Yeah, this game is mod support with the Steam Workshop page. Apparently it was meant to get further mod support that didn't really pan out, which is kind of lame, but the amount of costumes and weapons you can add to the game is pretty much limitless with this thing. And I mean limitless. Peep this Sephiroth trip. You can even get the OG vs. 13 outfit. You know, the one from the old trailers. Now that's a name I've not heard in a long time. I mostly went for costumes that were purely aesthetic and didn't modify stats, but you can do that too, if that's your thing. There's even full model swaps, which again, not my thing, but it's there. The mod support might not be anything that's that substantial, but it's a neat thing that adds a lot of variety, especially for a second playthrough or something. Now for the music, listen, I've got my hands together, I'm ready to go, repeat after me. Yoko Shimomura does not miss. Yeah, it's another Final Fantasy OST not composed by Uematsu, and his OSTs were consistently 10 out of 10s, but guys, it's Yoko Shimomura. Ken's theme, Gal's theme, and the rest of Street Fighter 2? You know, the tracks that are still being used in Street Fighter 5 and probably 6 to this day? Yoko Shimomura. Literally all of Kingdom Hearts? Yoko Shimomura. I've been playing through Kingdom Hearts' Melody of Memory in my off time while making this video, and you can really see how Shimomura's composing style from that series transferred over to Final Fantasy XV. But I mean, Kingdom Hearts is a series that's been running for like 20 years. It's no surprise it's got some of everything. 15 has so many good examples for each genre of music that fits in with certain situations. It's got good music for when it's time for the party to relax, it's got different battle themes depending on the time of day and area the battle's taking place in, it's got sweeping melodies for when you're out in the open world, and etc. If I had to pick a few favorites, I really like the vibe of Valsti Fantastica and the way its main melody is incorporated into other tracks, like Sunset Waltz. Also the version of Somnus with lyrics that plays in the final area. It really brings that theme you hear on the main menu whenever you start the game to a new level. The music is great, and the soundtrack is huge. I think it's like a hundred tracks or something, so there's just so much to love in the overall package. As for sound effects, there's not too much to say, but I did notice something. Probably because of how this game was made, there were a few parts in the game where there felt like there should have been a noise or something, but there just wasn't anything. Like, other cars on the road are weirdly silent. This isn't a great example, but it's the one I specifically saved. There's this one scene where Noctis almost falls and Gladio catches him. Where you'd expect there to be a sound effect or something when their hands slap together, it's just silent. And trust me, there's quite a few scenes like this. And since I guess this is kind of part of the sound design, it's time for me to talk a bit about the game's localization. Okay. Right off the bat, I don't know why they changed Sydney's name to Cindy. Like, the Sydney name is meant to go with the Sid name pun, you know, from every Final Fantasy game before it. It's not like Sydney isn't a name we have in English, so if it was changed because Cindy is a more common name, I'm still not sold on the idea. I found this forum post from director Tabata himself talking about the Sydney Cindy split. The way he addresses it, it kinda seems like it might have been a mistake that they were too deep in to change by the time they caught it. 
But that's all just speculation I got from trying to glean information from shady sources while combing the web like a crazy person just trying to understand this change. Anyways, for the most part, it seems unlike 13, 15 had a pretty smooth localization process. There's no real major issues or errors to note. On a personal level, I'm not really a big fan of how Prompto was handled. His English voice actor does a good job, don't get me wrong, but early in the game, I realized that you can never assume what Prompto is saying in Japanese is gonna match the English subtitles. He drops a lot of, uh, like, internet humor, which obviously isn't present in his Japanese dialogue. Like in one scene, he says, you mad bro, which was out of style even in 2016. And he also says, hashtag sorry not sorry. The other character's looking at him like, uh, excuse me, what the fuck is a hashtag? I don't think Twitter exists in the FF15 verse. I know a lot of this sounds nitpicky, and don't get me wrong, it is, and I know stuff like this might matter to literally only me. I'm not opposed to a heavy-handed localization as long as it sounds natural, but I think they could have pulled back on this one a little bit. Don't get me wrong, I like Prompto as a character, he's charming and brings a lot of humor to the main cast. Operation B2B Huh? Battle to break. From my research though, it seems that for Prompto specifically, the team abandoned listening to the Japanese version of the game midway through localizing his character, and it even says, which is unusual for a dub. Yeah, that definitely sounds a bit unusual to me. One objective point about the localization, however, is that it was done in every language at the same time to ensure a simultaneous worldwide release. This next problem isn't that widespread, but when browsing the wiki pages of certain characters, you'll come across this situation a few times. Where it's like, the Japanese and English wording is ambiguous, but the German localization clearly states X. Or, this loading screen provides this backstory in the English, Portuguese, and German versions of the game, but not in the Japanese, French, etc. Like, damn, I didn't know you had to be Mr. Worldwide to get the full picture of this thing. Again, I gotta stress, it's all incredibly minor details, but it's something that could have gotten a fix in the Royal Edition, just update the loading screens to be consistent. Now, from what I've said up till now, I wouldn't blame you if you haven't come to a decision on Final Fantasy XV yet. So far, there's been some highs and lows, but overall, I'd say it's mostly positive. But for RPGs, and especially for the Final Fantasy series, I'd say the main thing that stays in people's minds long after they hit credits and close the game for the last time is their stories and characters. And it's in these stories and characters where Final Fantasy XV has some low lows that honestly drive me crazy, but also where it hits its highest highs. With that said, let's talk about it. First, let's start with Noctis as a protagonist. Noctis is the chosen king of the Lucius bloodline, and while that does make him incredibly important, it's also a responsibility he never asked for and often struggles with. And yeah, it's a pretty raw deal. Sometimes it sucks to be the protagonist. He didn't know Lucius was gonna fall, or that his dad planned to die just to give Noctis a chance. Everything just happened around him, and now he has to pick up the pieces, and while he's more than willing to, it's a lot of weight to bear all at once. Noctis is pretty well characterized throughout the journey, but you, as a player, can influence that as well. Pretty often during dialogue, the screen will pause, giving you the option to pick what Noctis says next. You can make Noctis headstrong, you can make him aloof, or you can default to your friends for their take on decisions. You get rewards based on the different options, but it's also kinda cool that you, as the player, have small opportunities to define Noctis' personality through the roleplaying. Especially since dialogue choices like this have been a staple of the Final Fantasy series that, uh, have been on a leave of absence for a few years. Unless you count 13 too. And I won't tell you whether you should count it or not, that's your call. Aside from Noctis, I think it's pretty universally agreed upon that the relationship between the main four is one of the strongest driving factors in the game, and I think there's a good reason for that. Like I said before, this is a group dynamic that's fundamentally different from most other Final Fantasy games. The group dynamic these four have works really well. They all play to each other's personalities, which is something the writers could pull off by keeping the cast tight like this. But Final Fantasy XV's main cast isn't really the average makeup of the squad group chat. There are fundamental imbalances in their group dynamic that keeps things interesting. I mean, Noctis is the literal king of Lucius. He wants to treat his friends like equals, and they're more than willing to take him up on that, but at the end of the day, it's not that simple. Take Gladio. He's Noctis' friend, sure, but he's literally bound by oath to protect him, to die for him. How do you think he feels when Noctis is like, damn, this Chosen King of Destiny shit kinda sucks, for real, for real, when he's out there taking bullets for him? There's this one scene where Noctis and Gladio are alone, they're boiling hot, they're stressed out, and Gladio just blows up on him. It was anger caused by the heat of the moment, sure, but you can see how this relationship dynamic stresses their friendship. 
This goes similarly for Ignis, who has the role of the party's caretaker, and Prompto, who's the odd one out of the group because he's a commoner. Prompto doesn't really get the chance to rock the boat and say how he feels about certain things. He's worried that because of his status, it's a conditional friendship. It's these characters' struggles with this relationship that really elevates it, and trust me, they struggle. There's an event midway through the game that basically tears the group apart. You physically feel the tension in your real-life body as you watch them, a tight-knit group you've spent maybe two dozen hours with at this point, slowly split away, wondering how, or if, they can be put back together again. Stay tuned, we'll talk about it. These four characters were actually something that survived through most of this game's development. Seriously, if you go peep one of the oldest trailers for Versus 13, they make an appearance and look pretty much exactly the way they do now. You can tell that their involvement in the story was a long time in the making, and that importance is seen in the final game. Outside of the main four, 15 has a decently wide cast of side characters, and you can pretty firmly separate them into two camps. Those that got done dirty by the writers, and those that didn't. Lunafreya was hyped up to be the main heroine of the game pre-release, and while by definition, yeah, I mean, I guess she is, in the final game, her role in the story might not be what you'd expect. Her character is mostly shown through these flashback scenes with Noctis, and by the time she shows up in person, she gets like 15 minutes of screen time till they drag her to the recycle bin. She shows up, then immediately pieces out. For a good chunk of the story, I was wondering if her and Noctis actually wanted to get married to each other, or if it was just an obligation thing. Once you get pretty deep in the game, you learn that, no, it turns out they do really like each other. It was a genuine relationship. Should've, uh, you know, shown that to the player before it was too late. A lot of later scenes show how happy she was at getting to see Noctis again, and how important she was to him. Even if you can choose to socially awkward Sigma Grindset style deadpan her in this magic journal you pass back and forth. Gladio's sister Iris has a pretty significant role in the game as well, joining your party on multiple occasions, and it's pretty clear she has a crush on Noctis. I think she's a cool character. She's upbeat, tough, and serves as a good contrast to the testosterone squad. <laughs> It's just weird when she shows up, asks Noctis to hang out with her, they spend some time together, and by that point, it looks like she likes him a lot more than Luna does. Like, I mean, she's 15, so that ain't happening. But it just goes to show how long it takes for the game to be like, no, actually, Noctis and Luna are in love, though. While the main four and their dynamic are great, guest characters like Iris mixing in every now and again give it a little layer of spice that makes it so that it's not literally the only group dynamic in the game. Also, making this video and checking out her Final Fantasy wiki page has revealed to me that she has an official Minecraft skin? I don't know why, and I don't know why I have to be the one to take on this cursed knowledge, but if I gotta know, now you do too. As for the Imperial side, I'd call them Wasted Potential. All the trailers, as well as this scene near the start of Chapter 3, show this big lineup of Hit Squad killers, and you're like, okay, so these are probably gonna be the game's big bosses. Especially the Emperor. I mean, that's the dude that personally took out your dad and turned your home into a dust cloud. You'd figure there'd at least be some build-up to a fight with him. Unfortunately, most of these people end up dying off-screen, until you get to a special part of the game we'll talk about in a sec. The exception to this is Aranea Highwind, a villain turned temporary party member. You might know this already, but she's a dragoon, with her last name referencing Kane Highwind from Final Fantasy IV and Sid Highwind from Final Fantasy VII. Now, uh, tough girl character archetype voiced by Miyuki Sawashiro? Shit, that's all you had to say. I get why Prompto's catching feelings for her and Sid. Now, obvious character meant to appeal to specifically me aside, I think she plays a good role in the story overall. Like Iris, she'll join your group for a bit and make you think that, hey, maybe some Imperials aren't all that bad. Maybe not every single one is a power-obsessed megalomaniac retirement home escapee. And besides, can't be roasting on someone this dedicated to workers' rights. She's only in your party for a relatively short time, but it's a pretty good chance to get some exposition of what the Empire is like from the inside, especially from someone who doesn't quite agree with their actions. Also, I didn't know this until I went back into the post-game to get some extra footage, but apparently she can just show up randomly to join your party for a night battle? Don't know if that's new to the Royal Edition, but I'll take it. Which leaves us with our villain, and the poster boy for, did not in fact get done dirty by the writers, Arden. I gave Arden a long think on how I see him as a villain, and after looking through the rest of the series, I think I've come to a conclusion. The thing about Arden is, is that he's the kind of character where when you think about 15's villain, he comes to mind without any hesitation. 
He's iconic, and I think that's something 15 really needed. Especially since 13, the last mainline game, was an absolute barren desert when it came to villains. Bartandalus? Sure, I guess, but no one's making an hour-long video essay on his motivations and intentions, I'll tell you that for free. I mean, his lack of staying power was pretty obvious when they needed a second 13 character for Decidia City NT, and they were so starved for villain options, they're like, Snow? Good enough. If they could make Cloud of Darkness a playable character, they definitely could have made him one if they wanted to. Arden at least got a spot on that roster. Anyways, for Arden, I landed on something I think makes sense. Arden is a Caius-type character, the type of villain you don't really expect much out of at first, but ends up being one of the highlights of the game. You run into Arden a few times, and it's hard to get a handle of his intentions. He helps the party, but it always seems to be in this calculating, self-serving kind of way. Then he flips the switch and shows his hand, and you realize he's cruel, manipulating, and has a really strong drive to achieve his goal. And his motivations for it are pretty human. While you might disagree with his actions, you can kinda see what he's going for, even if he is a massive piece of shit. It's not hard to empathize with him considering the events that led to him ending up like this. I mean, Noctis sure does. You get the chance to see his journey as well, seeing him go from defeated indifference to determined action. His designer specifically mentioned that he used Kefka as an inspiration for Arden. You might have your own opinion about this. I mean, I think he's more Kuja than Kefka myself, but there definitely is that sort of sadistic evil to Arden's character. While 15 might not have the strongest cast of villains and side characters, Arden is the exception. Because like Caius, while you can't agree with his methods and the goal he's aiming for is absolutely catastrophic, you can understand his actions, and you know what kind of person he could have been if things were different. Back to the overall structure of the game, Final Fantasy XV's pacing is, uh... Kinda weird, to say the least. It's a bit hard to explain, but if you've played the game, you'll probably get what I mean. After Lucius is destroyed, the story kinda meanders for a bit. Noctis and the party have a few goals, but none of them really feel like a mainline plot to an RPG. They still need to go out and meet Luna, wherever she is. They also need to go tomb robbing for Noctis' great-grandpa's sword, and Noctis needing to receive the power of the six astrals this game summons becomes a goal after a few hours. There's also toppling the Empire, make sure to stick that on the list, revenge and all that. That's not to say 15 is directionless, but from the five hours or so from the fall of Lucius to the fight with Titan, it's hard to see how what you're doing shapes into the overall plot. It's basically, okay Noctis, time for you to go become the Chosen King. And then you're like, sure, how do I do that? Uh, I don't know, go get these magic swords, we'll figure it out on the way. It's not like it's bad, the plot moves forward and develops at a pretty decent rate, it's just that how the individual things you do shape into the larger plot as a whole take a second to become clear. And that's especially true when you contrast it to this game's extremely focused, plot-driven second half. So far, Final Fantasy XV has been all about its open-world structure. It's pretty much the main thing that was advertised about the game. But if you're in the know, you'll know that's only about half true. About two-thirds through the game, 15 just slams on the gas and sprints towards the end. Full on, let's go, time to wrap this shit up, we got credits to roll. From the events of Altissia onwards, the road trip is cancelled, and the game goes significantly more linear. I mean, I get why they did this. For some things, the open world structure just wasn't gonna work, and tightening up the level design for the final acts kinda makes sense, given what happens. I wouldn't say it feels like the game is just rushing you along, but chapters 9 to 14 consist of like, a single area each, as opposed to the first few taking place over multiple main quests across the open world. Thematically it works, since each of these later chapters takes place in a completely different area, but some are a lot shorter than the others. Like, like a lot shorter. If my Steam Achievement timestamps are to be believed, chapter 10 took me about an hour and a bit, and chapter 11 took me literally 10 minutes. The tone change at the halfway mark is heavy, in a good way, but as a result, the game kind of feels like it's got this hard split in the middle. I mean, you're on a train. The words on rails don't get any more literal than that. You can zoom out and see a world map in the second half, but you're not able to freely explore it. Maybe you were at some point in development. I feel like I saw somewhere once that there was planned to be free exploration in the second map with the post-game updates, but I couldn't find any information on it, so I'm willing to chalk it up to a fever dream. Both the first and second half of the game do have some really incredible story moments though. The things that happen are interesting, and we'll get into more details during the spoiler section later, but we have some more ground to cover before that. And, I want to talk about one section in particular that is very much not an incredible story moment. The second part of the game has this one special mention in it, and if you know, you already know what the next words to leave my mouth are gonna be. You got it? Yeah you do, it's chapter 13. Where do I even start with chapter 13? Okay, so when I originally put off playing Final Fantasy XV till all the patches came out, I was so smug when I heard fixing chapter 13 was part of the deal. 
I had already seen everyone complain at how awful it was, and I was like, huh, thanks for beta testing, chumps. Then after playing it, all I can say is, I don't even want to know what it was like beforehand. I remember when I beat this game in 2018, Chapter 13 was the worst part of the game by far. And then for the playthrough I did for this video, I was like, okay, I know how bad it is, I'm mentally prepared, I'm not getting blindsided, in and out, no big deal. No, no, they- I don't even know how they managed to get me again. So the way it works is, Noctis is alone and you can't use weapons. Instead, you can only use this magic ring. The game goes so linear, it makes Final Fantasy XIII Chapter 3 look like a Bethesda open world. Enemies just come at you one at a time, and you have to stand still to use magic, so you're just walking in a straight line, coming to a dead stop every 30 seconds to pop a bad guy. That, and occasionally, woo, spooky jump scare, dead robot was actually alive, mash circle, idiot. Haha, <laughs> innovative mechanics! Wow, I love being stopped every two minutes for a quick time event that I've quickly learned can't actually hurt me. Wow. It was kind of funny 15 minutes in. The joke got old about 30 minutes in. An hour in, and I was regretting not using the feature to do Ignis and Gladio's path through the chapter instead. The game was clearly offering me a way out, and I chose to needlessly suffer instead. I mean, the magic looks visually really cool, and it's fire when you can suck a group of enemies into the void dimension, but seeing the loading screen for the next chapter was like coming up out of the pool to breathe. It doesn't help either that, other than Chapter 14, which got a massive update in the Royal Edition to be a full mini-open area with new character dialogue, side quests, and bosses, Chapter 13 is the longest post-linear Switch one. But of course, you can't talk about current-day Final Fantasy XV's pacing without mentioning its DLC campaigns. Final Fantasy XV has five DLCs, and the first three are kinda like a set, so let's talk about them first. During the course of the game, there are a few sections where each of your companions are separated from the main party for a while. The first three DLCs are short campaigns that tell the story of what they were doing during that time. They also provide a contained area where you can learn to effectively use each of the three characters, then take those skills into the main game for when you switch in battle. The first is Episode Gladiolus, the shortest and, I guess you could say, least ambitious of the three. After Gladio gets the white boy confidence stomped out of him by Luna's brother, the Imperial General Ravis, he contacts Kor. Kor was one of Noctis' father's retainers, and he takes Gladio to the tempering ground so he can get more power to properly perform his duty as the King's Shield. To do this, he has to defeat Gilgamesh, the Blade Master. Yeah, they use this DLC as an excuse to put the Gilgamesh reference in, but whatever, I'll take any excuse for a new remix of Battle on the Big Bridge. Now Gilgamesh doesn't mess around. Kor says to Gladio, Bro, you are probably going to die. Are you sure you want to do this? But Gladio stays resolute, willing to die if it means just having a chance at getting the power to protect the king. Do you see what I was saying before about why I can understand Gladio getting frustrated at Noctis when he falters? In this DLC, you see this dude is willing to die just to give Noctis a slightly better chance at fulfilling his destiny, which means that the launch version of 15 without this DLC was severely lacking in context, but, I mean, past is the past, I guess. Episode Gladiolus is structured much more like a traditional action game. It's a linear adventure broken up by enemy encounters that become increasingly more difficult. Unlike the main game, you can't farm resources or level up, so it more tests your skill in the gameplay department, especially on the harder difficulties. Gladio also plays much more like a traditional action game character. While the hold to attack and defend mechanic is still there, it's much more focused on fast-paced reaction gameplay. Gladio gets powerful counters if you block at the correct time, and he builds up a super bar you can cash out to use a bunch of different skills. And, wait, those enemies glow red when they're about to use an attack that you can't block and have to dodge. Which means they fixed the problem I had with not being able to tell in the main game. Which also means they knew it was an issue. But the fix is only for this DLC. I'm not sure how to feel about this. Overall, it's a different play experience from Noctis, and the boss fight at the end does a good job at checking if you've properly mastered what Gladio has to offer. Now that said, it is super short, and it's basically a guided short story of what Gladio was up to in the whole hour he was gone. It definitely has the most limited scope of the DLCs. That's not to say it's bad, it's just quick and simple. Next up is the episode Prompto DLC, and you can see the scope take an immediate turn upwards. After Prompto is separated from the party, he gets captured by the Imperials and has to make his way out from behind enemy lines. We get to learn a lot about Prompto's backstory through this DLC, and you can really see him face challenges and grow as a character. This is mirrored in the tone of the DLC. In the beginning, Prompto's version of camping is having a sit down beside a vetting machine and enjoying a can of not boss coffee. Oh come on, not again. In the opening hour or so, he's alone, the music is somber, and even resting feels tense. 
Then midway through, Aranea shows up, gives him a pep talk, and backs him up for the rest of the campaign. After that, when you rest at a vending machine, the mood is lighter, the pair are having a conversation, and upbeat music plays. I really like the dynamic between these two characters, and I'm not just saying that because of my, um, biases. This DLC really helps flesh out Aranea's character in addition to the function she serves through gameplay. And gameplay-wise, this DLC is kind of insane. You're shooting dudes in third person, sneaking up behind to do stealth kills, stealing enemy weapons, firing a rifle from up high, and doing this really cool finishing shot combo. It really stretches the gameplay beyond what you think would be possible with this engine. Seriously, no cap, it almost feels like you're playing an entirely different game. The only thing that would make it better is if you could play as Aranea, but, you know, dreams can't always come true. This DLC also has a lot of set pieces with different mechanics, like the snowmobile chase. And there's this mini open world where you can do side quests to upgrade the snowmobile, which kinda doesn't make sense to do, because you lose access to it in like, five minutes? I don't know, I guess they just needed to give the intern some work to do or something. I know we talked about music already, but I gotta mention that the music for the episode Prompto DLC particularly slaps, and it's done by the Metal Gear composer. Actually, now that we're on the subject, you know, I joked about Prompto Gear Solid about an hour ago, but you can't tell me this boss fight isn't a reference to Big Boss and Ava taking on the Shagohod. I'm not hearing otherwise. Anyways, its unique gameplay, bomb story, and character interaction is why I personally think Episode Prompto is the best DLC of the bunch. <laughs> Moving on to the last of our boys trilogy, we have Episode Ignis, where you play as, you know, Ignis. This DLC has a completely different structure from the rest of them, and while we're at it, even different from the main game, really. While it has a few main missions that are more linear, it's set in a mini open area of Altissia that you can move around at will. The area is divided into different districts, and the point of the DLC is to go to each district, take out the Imperials there, and retake the area. You've even got this situation map you can open up that'll highlight your territory in blue and enemy territory in red. And with this system in mind, the game also gives you new ways to traverse across this area. Ignis gets access to a grapple hook you can use to zoom across the map, and it really changes up how you get around. Ignis' gameplay is similar to Noctis and Gladio's, but I think he's a lot more polished and has a lot more combat options than Gladio does. I really like Prompto's gameplay because it's so unique and different, but Ignis is probably the most fun playstyle of the three side lads. He gets access to his twin daggers from the main game, and can switch elements to change between single target, area of effect, and multi-target attacks. The thing about Ignis is that he has so many different combat options, you're never really just standing around doing basic attacks for long. He has stuff like a new Kemi counter you can use anytime you take a big hit, where he'll recover a bit of HP and do a big counterattack. You're constantly building up this meter called Total Clarity that'll give you a different super based on what dagger element you're currently using. And like Noctis, he has an L1 bar that he can spend for big hits or even a powered up state. Episode Prompto came out three months after Gladiolus, and Episode Ignis came out a full six months after that, so it's clear they used the extra time to really polish up Ignis' playstyle, and it shows. The story goes into what Ignis was up to while Noctis was taking on Leviathan, and it shows how we ended up with the aftermath Noctis wakes up to when the dust settles. There's some cool boss fights at the end, and the stuff that happens is pretty hype, if I say so myself. We'll cover it in the spoiler section. It even comes with an alternate ending as a completion bonus. This DLC is extremely short if you just rush the main story, probably the shortest one, but it isn't lacking in stuff to do, so overall, yeah, it's pretty good. Next is the Comrades Multiplayer DLC. It exists. This concludes my section about the Comrades Multiplayer DLC. The last piece of major story content is the Episode Arden DLC, which is the only one not to be included in the Royal Edition. Episode Arden is the beefiest of the DLC campaigns, which makes sense considering it was made about a year and a half after the rest. It was planned to be a part of a second wave of DLCs along with Episode Lunafreya and Episode Noctis, but they eventually got canned and only Arden saw the light of day. I'm sort of okay with this, because looking at what Episode Luna and Noct were supposed to be about, they were meant to kind of invalidate 15's ending, which I think is the best part of the game, but that's a different topic altogether. Let's focus on Arden for now. I guess Episode Ignis' small open structure was a big hit in the office, because for this DLC they went like, well, let's just do that again. In Episode Arden, you're once again placed in a small open world with non-linear objectives. This DLC tells a story about Arden doing an attack on Insomnia 35 years before the main game takes place. Your goal is to take out these bosses on top of towers to weaken the barrier protecting the capital building so you can go square up with Noctis' dad. Fight. Like Ignis's, a lot of focus was placed on Arden's traversal mechanics, and you're able to quickly speed around the map and up buildings. 
Now I get that this DLC probably had a lot of focus development time, but holy shit does Insomnia look really good. It was an area built from the ground up for this DLC, and there's just so much detail packed into every corner. The main game suffered for being too large and too barren, and this DLC is the exact opposite of that. Seriously, just walking around the streets and checking out the shops is really cool. As for gameplay, Arden plays a lot like Noctis, but with a few twists. You can summon Ifrit to fight with you in battle for a short time, giving you a huge advantage, and you can use these finishing attacks if you land the final hit of a sword combo. There's also a hat collecting mechanic, if, uh, that's what you're into. As for the story, first, let me just say that episode Arden is basically the lore dump DLC. They added these books scattered randomly across the main game in the Royal Edition that flesh out a bit of the world's history and background, but there's so few and far between and each offers so little, I don't know who thought this was a good idea. When episode Arden opens up, the game basically gives you a small area to walk around in that contains a full summary of Aeos' history, as well as information on the Star Scourge, a major plot point in the game and its origins. And when all the lore is neatly and thoughtfully collected and put together like this, yeah, I mean it's actually really interesting. Aeos is a cool world, and it's honestly kind of shocking it took them this long to decide that maybe it was a good idea to properly show that to the player. As for Arden himself, it's pretty impressive that this DLC can make an absolutely despicable character like him into an almost sympathetic one. It provided some much needed backstory to his character that was told to you in the main game, but actually seeing it in this DLC is a completely different experience. Episode Prompto is still my favorite DLC, but if you asked me which one was the best, I'd probably have to go with Episode Arden. One last thing, this isn't a DLC for the game, but I have no idea when else I'm going to get to talk about this, so here goes. There's this little beat-em-up game for PS4 and Xbox One called A King's Tale Final Fantasy XV. It tells a story about King Regis and one of his adventures with his entourage. I honestly expected nothing from this, and came away genuinely impressed. It's nothing groundbreaking and you can finish it in under an hour, but I thought the gameplay was really solid, and the sprite work was at times absolutely beautiful, especially considering you can get it for the price of… free. All I'm saying is, if you have a chance in an open afternoon, I definitely recommend giving it a go. Anyways, now that we have the context of the DLCs behind us, you can see how much it would impact the game if they were to be missing. Gladio goes, later homie, then pieces out only to come back an hour later like nothing's changed except for his new scar. It all just feels so half-assed. Without the DLC, after Prompto gets separated from the party, next time you meet with him, he just goes like, Sup fellas, by the way, here's my whole backstory summed up in two sentences. That, and it feels like the dev team going, whoops, we forgot to give all these Empire characters closure. Uh, here, we can flush them out in these DLCs. Which is all to say, I think it's pretty messed up that the game shipped with them missing. I know I'm doing a retrospective of the Royal Edition right now, but it makes me think that this game really shouldn't have come out in 2016. My biggest nitpick with the DLC, however, is that you're never really told when you should play them. I hate how you gotta have ESPN or some shit just to figure out when you're supposed to head back to the main menu to start them up. Do you play them as soon as a party member leaves? Do you wait a while and play them when they come back? How do you even know when they're going to come back? And the worst part is, there's no consistent answer, it's different for each. Your only real option is to look up a guide and hope you don't run into spoilers on the way, and even then, that's not perfect. Even though I think the optimal 15 experience is to play them as you go, these DLCs were originally meant for people who finished the game and came back to play them. Which means they aren't gonna hold back on spoilers. For example, it makes sense to play Episode Ignis after what happens in Altissia since it takes place during that, but then it has one scene that spoils the biggest twist in the game. And again, the most frustrating thing about this is how easily I came up with a fix just by thinking about it for 10 minutes. With the Royal Edition, they could have easily properly integrated these DLCs into the main campaign. Edit a few scenes here and there, then have the game prompt you with a text box going like, Hey, would you like to play Episode Gladio? Yes slash no. When it would be the proper time to do so. These DLCs are great, and they add a lot to the experience. And since 99% of people playing this game in current year are going to have them by default, I really think naturally integrating them into the playthrough was something the team should have focused on. Now, even with the Royal Edition and all the DLCs neatly assembled, I kept having these strange visions. I had these images in my mind about cutscenes I hadn't seen, story events that never showed up. I didn't remember seeing them in my two previous playthroughs either, but I couldn't shake the thoughts from my head. That I'd seen those cutscenes, I'd seen those story moments, but the question was, where? That's when I came across this Steam guide and I realized, oh my god, there's story cutscenes exclusive to the pre-release trailers. I've had enough, this is the Royal Edition, just put it in the game! 
Don't tell me you didn't know where to put it. You had no problem sticking in Noctis's weird CG nightmare that has no bearing on anything. I shouldn't have to go scavenging through trailers on YouTube trying to figure out which ones are the ones that have story bits in them. You could say it's minor, yeah, but it really should just be in the game. And with that, I think it's time we talk a bit about why it's like this. There's plenty of great videos dedicated to telling this story that go into a lot of detail, so I won't take too long. But I want to talk about the stuff that's relevant for this retrospective. Now listen, the developers weren't stupid. They didn't forget to press the make the game good button. It's a lot more complicated than that. Final Fantasy XV probably had one of the most troubled game developments in history, at least to my knowledge. Honestly, it's kind of a miracle this game even came out. This game was announced in 2006 and didn't see a release until 2016. To put that into perspective, in that time, a full console generation came and went. Multiple trilogies started and finished. Final Fantasy XIV came out, got retconned, 2.0 released, and Heavensward dropped. People probably died waiting for this game. There's probably some dude out there who saw this game get announced when they were in high school, then went to uni, graduated, got married, had kids, and by the time the game came out was like, actually, you know, I'm kind of over video games, for real, for real. Pouring one out for that guy. It's clear that a lot of stuff was going on behind the scenes. Insider stories talked about overworked staff, missed deadlines, and rumors about the game having an infamous negative reputation inside the company. What was supposed to be a spin-off of the 13 series ended up being turned into a mainline entry, and that makes sense. Square Enix was paying a massive AAA team salaries for the better part of a decade, so they needed the game to carry the weight of the costs they'd sunk into it. But even by the time of that name change, so much of the game was still on the cutting room floor. When Hajime Tabata joined the team as director later in development, he described a team that was exhausted and fretful, being crushed under the weight of the impending collapse of a game that still hadn't properly taken shape. Eventually, the game's eight-year director, Tetsuya Nomura, would leave the project entirely, being moved to Kingdom Hearts 3. From what I've seen, opinions on this part of development seem to be split online with half seeing it as Tabata muscling Nomura out of the project, and the other half seeing him steering the sinking ship to shore. The thing is, none of us were there. I mean, maybe you were. I definitely wasn't there, so I can't say for certain which of the two it was, but one thing is clear. That real, actual, proper development on this game didn't start until about 2014, only two years before its actual release. Two years of development isn't a long time for a AAA game being made on an entirely new engine. And that's especially clear when you look at the literal conga line of outside developers that rolls through the credits. This was a mad dash effort to get the game as complete as possible in time for release, getting as many hands on as they could. And the unfortunate reality of game development is, no matter what the project, you'll never have enough time. Deadlines will always exist. I mean, it was delayed at the last minute from its September 30th date to November. They squeezed out every second to make this game as complete as they could. Personally, I think the game was no way ready to ship in November 2016, but Square Enix had sunk a decade of funding into this game, and they were probably sick of waiting for their return on their investment. The order came down that it's gotta be out by this date. No excuses, no arguing. If you've been paying attention, you'll know I think the Royal Edition could use some more polish as well, but it strikes a good balance of feeling like it's the game they always intended to make. And for that, I have to commend the Final Fantasy XV team. They were extremely talented people forced to make a game under really suboptimal circumstances. And for the most part, they made a pretty damn good game. But something was left on the table in the Switch. Final Fantasy XV is not Final Fantasy Versus XIII. Versus 13 was basically a Final Fantasy game made by the Kingdom Hearts team that later merged with the Type-0 team, and influences from both sides can be seen, even in the final product. The thing is, Versus 13's original scope was just too ambitious for the short time frame of actual development it had. So in order to become a real thing that actually released, it had to become something else entirely. The product diverged so heavily from its original version that the game that was announced in 2006 might as well no longer exist. So many plot events and characters were reworked, or, like Stella, left out entirely. And that thing this game became, that something else, might not have been what people were expecting, or even wanted. Versus 13 was a fantasy daydream game, and with all the promises that were made about it during its 10-year development, in our minds, it basically could have been anything. And trust me, I'm with you all on this. I also lament the loss of Versus 13, of the game that could have been. I think it was totally natural to pick up 15 and initially feel a sense of disappointment. I really like 15, but it isn't Versus 13. 
It's not the game I bought a PS3 for, the game I waited 10 years for. But I also realize, that game we all waited for was one we created in our heads from a bunch of trailers of a project that never truly existed. Keeping that in mind, and playing 15 is 15 and not versus 13, I think there's a legitimately great game here that got caught in the crossfire. And up until four months ago, that's where our story would end. But in the ultimate case of, I lived, bitch, Versus 13 is resurfacing in Kingdom Hearts 4. Just from that initial trailer, it's clear that the DNA of Versus 13 lives on in that game. I mean, Noctis Calum means night sky in Latin. You know what night sky is in Japanese? Yozora. Versus 13 might be long gone, but both Final Fantasy 15 and Kingdom Hearts 4 carry on parts of its legacy. And while Kingdom Hearts 4 is still a long ways away, it just might be that game some people have been waiting for since 2006. I mean, it'll definitely at least be pretty damn good, right? That's practically a guarantee. Looking back to 2016, the Final Fantasy series was in a weird place after FF13 that I think it only just recently really recovered from. And maybe some of the cold reception 15 received on launch was due to that. Think about it, 15 had the pressure of having to be the make or break game after 13. I mean, hell, the entire poorly received 13 trilogy, and I think we can't discount that factor when it comes to its reception. 15 didn't have the luxury of just having to be a good Final Fantasy game. It had to be the game that made up for 13 and lived up to its own 10 year legacy. With Final Fantasy 15 nearing its sixth year anniversary, I think I can safely say the series is in a different place than it was in 2016. That was then, and this is now. Now, there are so many games in the Final Fantasy series dropping in just the next two years, I think even the most jaded of fans would consider the series, quote, back. I think a lot more people are looking positively towards the future of the Final Fantasy series in 2022, as opposed to how they were looking cautiously towards it in 2016. I mean, we got Final Fantasy 16 to look forward to now, and all I gotta say about that is, I trust Yoshi P with my life. That game is definitely gonna be fire. Now to make my last points on Final Fantasy XV's story, I've basically gotta go all out with the spoilers, so if you've stuck around till now and don't want to know what happens, skip to here. If you gotten this deep in, you a real one. So that big event I kept mentioning that hard cuts the game in half is the Battle of Altissia, where Noctis and the gang basically get destroyed. They lose hard. Luna is killed by Arden, and in an attempt to save Noctis, Ignis puts on the Ring of the Luciai, a magic ring that's kept by the Lucius family line that only they can wield. And that's not just funny haha flavor text. It gives Ignis enough power to hold off Arden, but in exchange, it permanently robs him of his eyesight. Noctis manages to get Leviathan's power in this absolutely terrible boss fight, but he's lost basically everything. Again and again, more sacrifices are made to get him closer to his goal. There's a line early in the game by Kor where he asks Noctis how long he intends to remain the protected, rather than becoming the protector. This stuck with me, and if you keep that line in mind as you play the game, you'll see how that statement comes to define Noctis' journey. Noctis is the protected, he's protected by the people around him, and as long as he is, he'll keep losing people. He's lost his father, his country, his partner, his friends have given up literal parts of their body just so he can have the chance of becoming the chosen king. He needs to become the protector, but it's becoming increasingly obvious to him, as well as to the player, that he's just physically not capable. One man is being asked to shoulder the weight of the world, and he can't. It feels impossible, and he's cracking under the pressure. He's reasonably pretty messed up after Altesia, and Gladio is pissed, especially for what happened to Ignis. Words are said, like, this is a straight-up fight, and you just feel so uncomfortable watching it. You were doing the road trip thing not even two hours ago, and now you're looking at four very demoralized people shambling towards their final goal, the Imperial Capital. When the Altissia chapter ends, the game makes you look at the pictures you took earlier in the day before the battle. All happy pictures of the gang together, and all looking forward to meeting Luna, and it makes you wonder if you'll ever see them hopeful like that again. When you camp later, there's none of the usual dialogue, and Ignis can't cook. It's really here where you feel how different it all is now, and it really catches up to you and hits you. Ignis eventually demands the party make up, but you can hear the heartbreak in his voice where he admits, mostly to himself, that being blind is probably going to be permanent, but he still wants to stay with the party. The tension is resolved, but it's only replaced with a sense of uncertainty knowing the final battle's coming close. 
You feel a genuine connection to these four having spent so long with them, so the emotional roller coaster they go through in these scenes are felt by you as well. And you'd think this is where the game decides the party has suffered enough, but surprise, Arden's caught up with them. He tricks Noctis into shoving Prompto off the moving train, landing him straight into enemy territory, meaning the three remaining friends have to enter the Imperial capital city alone. This is where episode Prompto takes place, and it mostly deals with Prompto's feelings of betrayal with this event, combined with his prior feelings of inadequacy, combined with him learning that he's a clone soldier originally made in an Imperial lab. Prompto probably has the second most compelling character arc next to Noctis, as he eventually comes to terms with himself and realizes that no matter what, he can trust his friends. Back to the main party, there's a lot of cool stuff to see in these final areas. The Imperial Continent is a desert that immediately backs up onto a massive tundra due to the Empire's killing of Shiva and their conquest. It's really atmospheric how you can see the train slowly slink through the darkness, making its way to its final destination, as you see Shiva's massive remains in the distance. Another cool area is the Empire itself. As soon as you get there, it's immediately clear that something is off. I mean, Evil Empire doesn't sound like it's gonna be ranked very high on the list of most livable cities, but what was meant to be the technological utopia of a militaristic Rome-style civilization is instead a dead city that's slowly falling apart. Then, when the full party finally reunites and reaches the crystal, it basically confirms the suspicions you and the characters have about Noctis, that he ain't shit. It says to him straight up, you are not worthy to be the chosen king, but you can be before sucking him inside as his friends hopelessly watch. The game opens up again with Noctis awakening on an island ten years later to a destroyed world, the World of Ruin. This FF6 reference is only present in the English version apparently, by the way. This is why at the beginning of the game there was a scene where an older version of the party fought Ifrit. See? Told you it would come back. So here's a story. Two thousand years ago, there was a plague called the Star Scourge that started slow enough at first, but eventually, people realized it could destroy mankind if it wasn't contained. To counter it, Bahamut gave the crystal to humanity for protection, and gave the responsibility of protecting that crystal to the Lucius bloodline. The bloodline had two candidates, Somnus Lucius Calum, the Founder King, and Arden Lucius Calum. Arden had the power to heal people who were afflicted by the Star Scourge by taking it into his body, and while he was meant to be the Chosen King, he was usurped by Somnus, who killed his GF, Luna's ancestor. He tried to kill Arden too, but turns out Arden was immortal, so he locked him away on an island for thousands of years. You see Noctis' ancestor, the king that was built up to be this noble hero, this founder of the bloodline, was just an absolute piece of shit. Willing to kill his own brother for a little crown title next to his gamer tag. Arden lost everything, and in the beginning, he didn't even want revenge. It wasn't until the star scourge within him deteriorated his mind that he decided to enact his plan. He wanted to kill Noctis when Noctis properly became the true king, finally earning retribution for having everything taken from him so long ago. Everything he's done up until this point has been to lead Noctis to that crystal, so he can become the true king. The Star Scourge has been going rampant in the past ten years Noctis has been asleep. It's basically completely blocked out the sun, and you know who comes out when that happens. Demons. You see a world that's pushed to the brink, with its last survivors living in strongholds kept alive with massive lights. Noctis reunites with his friends, and it's heartfelt. It's been ten years, and their friend has finally come back to them, but there's a catch. In order for Noctis to fulfill his destiny as the true king and rid the world of the plague, he has to trade his life. This is the twist episode Ignis spoils, by the way, in case you remember that. Noctis is reunited with the people he cares about, only to know he'll have to say goodbye when he succeeds. There's a lot of really powerful moments here. There's this one phone call with Iris, who doesn't know Noctis has to die, and to keep her spirits up, he hides the truth from her, promising they'll see each other soon. The voice actors in Japanese absolutely slay this scene, the line delivery is 100% on point. Then there's this one final camp scene where Noctis says he's made his peace, that he's fully prepared and accepted what has to happen. But at the same time, seeing his friends again, being together again, has made him realize he doesn't want to go, and he breaks down telling them how much they mean to him. Like, man, the entire back half of this game is emotional gut punch after emotional gut punch. The final area has been totally revamped for the Royal Edition. While I spent maybe like 30 minutes on this chapter in 2018, this time around, I was here for a good few hours. There's a lot to do, and you, as a player, probably feel the same way Noctis does. You know fulfilling your goal here means it's the end, and it's hard to accept that. You want the journey to go on a little longer, so doing side quests here kind of feels like prolonging that. Prolonging your last moments with your friends. 
There's also a new final dungeon where you fight three bosses that does a really good job of naturally integrating playing as each party member as the fights progress. See? They can do it. I don't want to hear they couldn't make it work for the DLCs. Right before the final fight with Arden, my favorite part comes up. Prompto tells you he kept all the pictures from your journey, and you're asked to take one with you. One picture that means the most to you, the player. As you scroll through the pictures, you get the full scope of your entire journey. Everywhere you went, the things you did, and the places you've been. Final Fantasy XV isn't the longest RPG. It's maybe 25 to 30 hours, but you really feel how far you've come with these characters. And it's right here, where all the memories come flooding back. The final boss fight is, honestly, nothing special. Like Leviathan, the second half has got this flying around particle effect section that looks visually exciting, but bores me half to tears. Eventually, Noctis beats Arden and frees him from his curse of immortality, then gives his life to rid the world of the Star Scourge. The final scene is you getting to see the sun rising for the first time in a decade, as Noctis shows Luna the picture you chose in the afterlife. Or something. I don't know, they're ghosts, I guess. During the credits, the gameplay Stand By Me as it shows you a compilation of all the pictures you took during your journey, and man, this just got me. For all of Final Fantasy XV's flaws, I think its ability to just evoke raw emotion in the player is one of its greatest strengths. And it's why, all these years later, I still think about it, and I still want to talk about it. And that's it. So after all this, what are the final thoughts on Final Fantasy XV? One of the most common genres of comments I got on my Final Fantasy XIII video was, quote, I never got why so many people hate XIII. It's way better than XV was. Oh, and every no. time I saw one of those, I just started nervously sweating. I like XIII, but I have to qualify that like by saying, it's got a ton of problems, I can't call it a great game, and if you play it, you might end up disliking it, but I think it should at least be given a real chance. Final Fantasy XV has its fair share of problems as well, but I think the Royal Edition is a genuinely good game. And honestly, I don't think you can go wrong by giving it a try, especially if you grab it on sale or something. Final Fantasy XV didn't review poorly on release, but hey, I mean, neither did XIII. Recency bias, especially in mainstream review outlets, is a thing, and oh boy does it drive me crazy. I mean, hell, the updated complete version of XV on Metacritic has a lower score than the base launch version. Someone want to explain to me how that works? From a lot of players, 15 got a lot of absolutely deserved heat on release. It was a solid game, but it was pretty obviously incomplete, and fan reception was rightly a bit cold. But I think right here, right now, I really enjoyed what I played, and maybe you will too. I don't like doing numbers on reviews since they're arbitrary and all mean different things to different people, but looking at the Royal Edition's Metacritic user score, I think it's a little high, but it's definitely representative of the level of quality I personally believe 15 to be at. While it's pretty easy to see the signs of a troubled development, it's got solid combat, an interesting setting, and a really hard-hitting emotional story. It's not the best Final Fantasy, nor is it my favorite Final Fantasy, but I've played them all multiple times, and I'm at least insane enough to go on the internet and say it's probably in my top six. Its reception reminds me a lot of Final Fantasy VIII's. You have a lot of people who either love it or hate it. No one's really in the middle. And I'd also probably put Final Fantasy VIII in my top six, so, uh, do with that information what you will. Anyways, uh, as I'm typing these letters, I've edited an hour and eight minutes of footage, and that was ten script pages ago, so I don't even want to know what minute we're going to be on when I say this line. If you've watched up to here, thanks for tuning in this long for a game I really wanted to talk about. I know it was a mouthful, but I really didn't want to leave anything unsaid. Hope you stick around for the next video. It's on a shorter game that I'm also pretty passionate about. I'm, uh, I I'm gonna go have a nap now. For, like, a week. Maybe. Till next time.